The Lost Poacher By Jack London But they won't take excuses. You're across the line, and that's enough. They'll take you. In you go, Siberia and the salt mines. And as for Uncle Sam, why, what's he to know about it? Never a word will get back to the States. The Mary Thomas, the papers will say, the Mary Thomas lost with all hands. Probably in a typhoon in the Japanese seas. That's what the papers will say, and people, too. In you go, Siberia and the salt mines. Dead to the world and kith and kin, though you live fifty years. In such manner John Lewis, commonly known as the sea lawyer, settled the matter out of hand. It was a serious moment in the forecastle of the Mary Thomas. No sooner had the watch below begun to talk the trouble over, than the watch on deck came down and joined them. As there was no wind, every hand could be spared with the exception of the man at the wheel, and he remained only for the sake of discipline. Even Bub Russell, the cabin boy, had crept forward to hear what was going on. However, it was a serious moment, as the grave faces of the sailors bore witness. For the three preceding months the Mary Thomas sealing schooner, had hunted the seal pack along the coast of Japan and north to Bering Sea. Here, on the Asiatic side of the sea, they were forced to give over the chase, or rather, to go no farther, for beyond, the Russian cruisers patrolled forbidden ground, where the seals might breed in peace. A week before she had fallen into a heavy fog accompanied by calm. Since then the fog bank had not lifted, and the only wind had been light airs and cat's paws. This in itself was not so bad, for the sealing schooners are never in a hurry so long as they are in the midst of the seals, but the trouble lay in the fact that the current at this point bore heavily to the north. Thus the Mary Thomas had unwittingly drifted across the line, and every hour she was penetrating, unwillingly, farther and farther into the dangerous waters where the Russian bear kept guard. How far she had drifted no man knew. The sun had not been visible for a week, nor the stars, and the captain had been unable to take observations in order to determine his position. At any moment a cruiser might swoop down and hail the crew away to Siberia. The fate of other poaching seal hunters was too well known to the men of the Mary Thomas, and there was cause for grave faces. Mine friends, spoke up a German boat steerer, it vas a pad pisiness. Schust as v make a big catch, you and the all honest, somethings go wrong, you and the der Russians nab us, dake our skins and our schooner, you and the send us mit der anarchists to Siberia. ACH a pretty pad pisiness. Yes, that's where it hurts, the sea lawyer went on. Fifteen hundred skins in the salt piles, and all honest, a big payday coming to every man jack of us, and then to be captured and lose it all. It'd be different if we'd been poaching, but it's all honest work in open water. But if we haven't done anything wrong, they can't do anything to us, can they? Bob queried. It strikes me as, ow oh, it ain't the proper thing for a boy oh, your age shove in, in when, his elders is talkin', protested an English sailor, from over the edge of his bunk. Oh, that's all right, Jack, answered the sea lawyer. He's a perfect right to. Ain't he just as liable to lose his wages as the rest of us? Wouldn't give threepence for them. Jack sniffed back. He had been planning to go home and see his family in Chelsea when he was paid off, and he was now feeling rather blue over the highly possible loss, not only of his pay, but of his liberty. How are they to know, the sea lawyer asked in answer to Bub's previous question. Here we are in forbidden water. How do they know but what we came here of our own accord? Here we are, fifteen hundred skins in the hold. How do they, know whether we got them in open water or in the closed sea? Don't you see, Bub, the evidence is all against us. If you caught a man with his pockets full of apples like those which grow on your tree, and if you caught him in your tree besides, what did you think if he told you he couldn't help it, and had just been sort of blown there, and that anyway those apples came from some other tree what did you think, eh? Bub saw it clearly when put in that light, 
and shook his head despondently. You'd rather be dead than go to Siberia, one of the boat pullers said. They put you into the salt mines and work you till you die. Never see daylight again. Why, I've heard tell of one fellow that was chained to his mate, and that mate died. And they were both chained together. And if they send you to the quicksilver mines you get salivated. I'd rather be hung than salivated. What salivated? Jack asked, suddenly sitting up in his bunk at the hint of fresh misfortunes. Why, the quicksilver gets into your blood, I think that's the way. And your gums all swell like you had the scurvy, only worse, and your teeth get loose in your jaws. And big ulcers form, and then you die horrible. The strongest man can't last long a mining quicksilver. A pad pisiness, the boat steerer reiterated, dolorously, in the silence which followed. A pad pisiness. I wish I was in Yokohama. Eh. Vot vast dot. The vessel had suddenly heeled over. The decks were aslant. A tin pannikin rolled down the inclined plane, rattling and banging. From above came the slapping of canvas and the quivering rat tat tat of the after leech of the loosely stretched foresail. Then the mate's voice sang down the hatch, all hands on deck and make sail. Never had such summons been answered with more enthusiasm. The calm had broken. The wind had come which was to carry them south into safety. With a wild cheer all sprang on deck. Working with mad haste, they flung out topsails, flying jibs and staysails. As they worked, the fog bank lifted and the black vault of heaven, bespangled with the old familiar stars, rushed into view. When all was shipshape, the Mary Thomas was lying gallantly over on her side to a beam wind and plunging ahead due south. Steamer's lights ahead on the port bow, sir, cried the lookout from his station on the forecastle head. There was excitement in the man's voice. The captain sent Bub below for his night glasses. Everybody crowded to the lee rail to gaze at the suspicious stranger, which already began to loom up vague and indistinct. In those unfrequented waters the chance was one in a thousand that it could be anything else than a Russian patrol. The captain was still anxiously gazing through the glasses, when a flash of flame left the stranger's side, followed by the loud report of a cannon. The worst fears were confirmed. It was a patrol, evidently firing across the bows of the Mary Thomas in order to make her heave to. Hard down with your helm, the captain commanded the steersman, all the life gone out of his voice. Then to the crew, back over the jib and foresail. Run down the flying jib. Clue up the foretopsail. And aft here and swing on to the main sheet. The Mary Thomas ran into the eye of the wind, lost headway, and fell to courtesying gravely to the long seas rolling up from the west. The cruiser steamed a little nearer and lowered a boat. The sealers watched in heartbroken silence. They could see the white bulk of the boat as it was slacked away to the water, and its crew sliding aboard. They could hear the creaking of the davits and the commands of the officers. Then the boat sprang away under the impulse of the oars, and came toward them. The wind had been rising, and already the sea was too rough to permit the frail craft to lie alongside the tossing schooner, but watching their chance, and taking advantage of the boarding ropes thrown to them, an officer and a couple of men clambered aboard. The boat then sheared off into safety and lay to its oars, a young midshipman, sitting in the stern and holding the yoke lines, in charge. The officer, whose uniform disclosed his rank as that of second lieutenant in the Russian Navy, went below with the captain of the Mary Thomas to look at the ship's papers. A few minutes later he emerged, and upon his sailors removing the hatch covers, passed down into the hold with a lantern to inspect the salt piles. It was a goodly heap which confronted him fifteen hundred fresh skins, the season's catch, and under the circumstances he could have had but one conclusion. I am very sorry, he said, in broken English to the sealing captain, when he again came on deck, but it is my duty, in the name of the Tsar, to seize your vessel as a poacher caught with fresh skins in the closed sea. The penalty, as you may know, is confiscation and imprisonment. 
The captain of the Mary Thomas shrugged his shoulders in seeming indifference, and turned away. Although they may restrain all outward show, strong men, under unmerited misfortune, are sometimes very close to tears. Just then the vision of his little California home, and of the wife and two yellow-haired boys, was strong upon him, and there was a strange, choking sensation in his throat, which made him afraid that if he attempted to speak he would sob instead. And also there was upon him the duty he owed his men. No weakness before them, for he must be a tower of strength to sustain them in misfortune. He had already explained to the second lieutenant, and knew the hopelessness of the situation. As the sea lawyer had said, the evidence was all against him. So he turned aft, and fell to pacing up and down the poop of the vessel over which he was no longer commander. The Russian officer now took temporary charge. He ordered more of his men aboard, and had all the canvas clued up and furled snugly away. While this was being done, the boat plied back and forth between the two vessels, passing a heavy hawser, which was made fast to the great towing bits on the schooner's forecastle head. During all this work the sealers stood about in sullen groups. It was madness to think of resisting, with the guns of a man of war not a biscuit toss away, but they refused to lend a hand, preferring instead to maintain a gloomy silence. Having accomplished his task, the lieutenant ordered all but four of his men back into the boat. Then the midshipman, a lad of sixteen, looking strangely mature and dignified in his uniform and sword, came aboard to take command of the captured sealer. Just as the lieutenant prepared to depart, his eyes chanced to alight upon Bub. Without a word of warning, he seized him by the arm and dropped him over the rail into the waiting boat, and then, with a parting wave of his hand, he followed him. It was only natural that Bub should be frightened at this unexpected happening. All the terrible stories he had heard of the Russians served to make him fear them, and now returned to his mind with double force. To be captured by them was bad enough, but to be carried off by them, away from his comrades, was a fate of which he had not dreamed. Be a good boy, Bub, the captain called to him, as the boat drew away from the Mary Thomas's side, and tell the truth. I, I, sir, he answered, bravely enough, by all outward appearance. He felt a certain pride of race, and was ashamed to be a coward before these strange enemies, these wild Russian bears. UND be politeful, the German boat steerer added, his rough voice lifting across the water like a foghorn. Bub waved his hand in farewell, and his mates clustered along the rail as they answered with a cheering shout. He found room in the stern sheets, where he fell to regarding the lieutenant. He didn't look so wild or bearish, after all very much like other men, Bub concluded, and the sailors were much the same as all other man of war's men he had ever known. Nevertheless, as his feet struck the steel deck of the cruiser, he felt as if he had entered the portals of a prison. For a few minutes he was left unheeded. The sailors hoisted the boat up, and swung it in on the davits. Then great clouds of black smoke poured out of the funnels, and they were underway to Siberia, Bub could not help but think. He saw the Mary Thomas swing abruptly into line as she took the pressure from the hawser, and her side lights, red and green, rose and fell as she was towed through the sea. Bub's eyes dimmed at the melancholy sight, but but just then the lieutenant came to take him down to the commander, and he straightened up and set his lips firmly, as if this were a very commonplace affair and he were used to being sent to Siberia every day in the week. The cabin in which the commander sat was like a palace compared to the humble fittings of the Mary Thomas, and the commander himself, in gold lace and dignity, was a most august personage, quite unlike the simple man who navigated his schooner on the trail of the seal pack. Bub now quickly learned why he had been brought aboard, and in the prolonged questioning which followed, told nothing but the plain truth. The truth was harmless, only a lie could have injured his cause. He did not know much, except that they had been sealing far to the south in open water, and that when the calm and fog came down upon them, being close to the line, they had drifted across. Again and again he insisted that they had not lowered a boat or shot a seal in the week they had been drifting about in the Forbidden Sea, but the commander chose to consider all that he said to be a tissue of falsehoods, and adopted a bullying tone in an effort to frighten the boy. 
He threatened and cajoled by turns, but failed in the slightest to shake Bub's statements, and at last ordered him out of his presence. By some oversight, Bub was not put in anybody's charge, and wandered up on deck unobserved. Sometimes the sailors, in passing, bent curious glances upon him, but otherwise he was left strictly alone. Nor could he have attracted much attention, for he was small, the night dark, and the watch on deck intent on its own business. Stumbling over the strange decks, he made his way aft where he could look upon the sidelights of the Mary Thomas, following steadily in the rear. For a long while he watched, and then lay down in the darkness close to where the hawser passed over the stern to the captured schooner. Once an officer came up and examined the straining rope to see if it were chafing, but Bub cowered away in the shadow undiscovered. This, however, gave him an idea which concerned the lives and liberties of twenty-two men, and which was to avert crushing sorrow from more than one happy home many thousand miles away. In the first place, he reasoned, the crew were all guiltless of any crime, and yet were being carried relentlessly away to imprisonment in Siberia a living death, he had heard, and he believed it implicitly. In the second place, he was a prisoner, hard and fast, with no chance of escape. In the third, it was possible for the twenty-two men on the Mary Thomas to escape. The only thing which bound them was a four-inch hawser. They dared not cut it at their end, for a watch was sure to be maintained upon it by their Russian captors, but at this end, ah! At his end! Bub did not stop to reason further. Wriggling close to the hawser, he opened his jackknife and went to work, the blade was not very sharp, and he sawed away, rope yarn by rope yarn, the awful picture of the solitary Siberian exile he must endure growing clearer and more terrible at every stroke. Such a fate was bad enough to undergo with one's comrades, but to face it alone seemed frightful. And besides, the very act he was performing was sure to bring greater punishment upon him. In the midst of such somber thoughts, he heard footsteps approaching. He wriggled away into the shadow. An officer stopped where he had been working, half stooped to examine the hawser, then changed his mind and straightened up. For a few minutes he stood there, gazing at the lights of the captured schooner, and then went forward again. Now was the time. Bub crept back and went on sawing. Now two parts were severed. Now three. But one remained. The tension upon this was so great that it readily yielded. Splash! The freed end went overboard. He lay quietly, his heart in his mouth, listening. No one on the cruiser but himself had heard. He saw the red and green lights of the Mary Thomas grow dimmer and dimmer. Then a faint hello came over the water from the Russian prize crew. Still nobody heard. The smoke continued to pour out of the cruiser's funnels, and her propellers throbbed as mightily as ever. What was happening on the Mary Thomas? Bub could only surmise, but of one thing he was certain, his comrades would assert themselves and overpower the four sailors and the midshipmen. A few minutes later he saw a small flash, and straining his ears heard the very faint report of a pistol. Then, oh joy! Both the red and green lights suddenly disappeared. The Mary Thomas was retaken. Just as an officer came aft, Bub crept forward, and hid away in one of the boats. Not an instant too soon. The alarm was given. Loud voices rose in command. The cruiser altered her course. An electric searchlight began to throw its white rays across the sea, here, there, everywhere, but in its flashing path no tossing schooner was revealed. Bub went to sleep soon after that, nor did he wake till the grey of dawn. The engines were pulsing monotonously, and the water, splashing noisily, told him the decks were being washed down. One sweeping glance, and he saw that they were alone on the expanse of ocean. The Mary Thomas had escaped. As he lifted his head, a roar of laughter went up from the sailors. Even the officer, who ordered him taken below and locked up, could not quite conceal the laughter in his eyes. 
Bub thought often in the days of confinement which followed, that they were not very angry with him for what he had done. He was not far from right. There is a certain innate nobility deep down in the hearts of all men, which forces them to admire a brave act, even if it is performed by an enemy. The Russians were in no wise different from other men. True, a boy had outwitted them, but they could not blame him, and they were sore puzzled as to what to do with him. It would never do to take a little mite like him in to represent all that remained of the lost poacher. So, two weeks later, a United States man-of-war, steaming out of the Russian port of Vladivostok, was signaled by a Russian cruiser. A boat passed between the two ships, and a small boy dropped over the rail upon the deck of the American vessel. A week later he was put ashore at Hakodate, and after some telegraphing, his fare was paid on the railroad to Yokohama. From the depot he hurried through the quaint Japanese streets to the harbor, and hired a sampan boatman to put him aboard a certain vessel whose familiar rigging had quickly caught his eye. Her gaskets were off, her sails unfurled, she was just starting back to the United States. As he came closer, a crowd of sailors sprang upon the forecastle head, and the windlass bars rose and fell as the anchor was torn from its muddy bottom. Yankee ship come down the river, the sea lawyer's voice rolled out as he led the anchor song. Pull, my bully boys, pull, roared back the old familiar chorus, the men's bodies lifting and bending to the rhythm. Bob Russell paid the boatman and stepped on deck. The anchor was forgotten. A mighty cheer went up from the men, and almost before he could catch his breath he was on the shoulders of the captain, surrounded by his mates, and endeavoring to answer twenty questions to the second. The next day a schooner hove to off a Japanese fishing village, sent ashore four sailors and a little midshipman, and sailed away. These men did not talk English, but they had money and quickly made their way to Yokohama. From that day the Japanese village folk never heard anything more about them, and they are still a much talked of mystery. As the Russian government never said anything about the incident, the United States is still ignorant of the whereabouts of the lost poacher, nor has she ever heard, officially, of the way in which some of her citizens shanghaied five subjects of the Tsar. Even nations have secrets sometimes.